So, of course, the question then arises, how do you build an external network like SHIB and an internal network like RAM? Because a strong cohesive team internally is great for execution, but a very sparse network externally is great for coming up with new ideas. Then we need to think about how do connections form? Where do people get their contacts from? And in today's modern contemporary society, uh, there are really four big ways in which people form connections. Right. So the first one is through what is called co-location. Second one, social similarity. Third one is referrals. Fourth one is shared activity. I'm going to walk you through each of these. What is co-location? Well, whether we like it or not, our world is organized in a particular way. We have countries. Inside a country, there are states. Inside states, there are cities. Inside cities, there are offices. And then we go into an office of a particular company. Well, that company is organized in a particular way. There are departments. There are business units. And then there are departments. There's a finance department. There's a customer service. There's manufacturing. All of those departments are there. And then we get a job in one particular department. In one particular department, in one particular office, in a particular city. As a result, we are going to form connections to people whom we meet in those locations. So then you form deep connections to your work colleagues uh, or your neighboring colleague and so on. And in that case, your social capital is an unintended byproduct. It's caused by organization structure. You, know, you joined, uh, I don't know, big company like Infosys, they're organized in a particular way. Somebody else joins a big company like Hindustan Unilever, then you know, they're organized in a different way. So you form connections, which is fundamentally driven by the organization that you are a part of. The important point to remember here is, let's go back to the earlier, earlier discussion. What is important for having a good network? Trust. How is trust formed in these kinds of, in these kinds of office kind of uh, um, uh, contacts? It's formed because of common third parties. Right? People you know also know each other. So it's very hard for you to say one thing and do something else in that atmosphere. So that's how trust is formed. Because we have common third parties, there's more trust, faster trust formation. Another important way in which people form connections is they reach out unconsciously almost to people who are similar to them. And you can notice this in your own behavior when you go into a party, right? Who do you talk to first? Oftentimes, you go and talk to somebody whom you already know, right? So you already go and form, a, you talk to somebody whom you already know, that's a repeat connection. But if you don't know anyone, then what happens, right? Go and look at your own behavior. You might notice that you often tend to go and talk to people who are like you. And there are many different dimensions. It could be gender. It could be, you know, the region of India you come from. It could be something else. It could be your occupation. Right. So, but there's always a similarity uh, that attracts you. And again, here, you know, because our minds, our brains are wired that way, we tend to form more trustworthy connection because we feel people who are like us are likely to be more trustworthy. Okay. So that's kind of the mechanism through which you form a connection because of similarity. These are great, and this happens to everyone. But if you want to be an entrepreneur and you want to have a, you know, a, a diverse network, it's very not a good idea to rely only on these, okay? Because you're going to end up with more cohesive clique-like networks. It's less likely for you to spot novel problems and solutions because you're mainly in contact with similar people. Of course, it makes you feel good. Right? People are going to tell you only positive things uh, about you. Nobody wants to tell you anything to your face, which is not good. Right? But it can cut you off from the world, especially when things are changing very fast. But there's two other ways to form connection, which are more active ways. Uh, the first one is a referral. Referral is a very active way to build social capital. Um, here, what happens is you already know someone, and that person is you go and consciously ask this person, I want to meet somebody like this. Okay, do you know anyone and can you connect me? Right? So that's an active way to form a connection. And here again, trust is built up faster because there's a common third party, the referee who connects you to your target. 
right? So referral is an active way to form, uh, to build your social capital. Another active way to build your social capital is something which we call as uh, shared activity. Uh, what do I mean by shared activity? Let me walk you through an example because this is actually a pretty important way in which you can actually build your social capital, which is important for entrepreneurs. So let me walk you through the example. The example is the following. This guy on the screen, he's a very creative fellow. His name is Marcel. He's a Dutch citizen living in Singapore. He's an artist. Um, and he, wor he works as a junk lecturer in an art school called La Salle. Uh, I know him through some mutual connection because, uh, you know, we ended up, uh, my wife and I, we have some of his art. And uh, then I ended up actually having dinner once with this gentleman here, with an Indian guy who is, um, you know, Mar so Mar Mar Marcel loves football, loves beer, uh, you know, very arty kind of person, and then um, works in an art school. Then I meet this other guy who is an Indian guy who loves cricket, who is vegetarian, does not drink, uh, IT nerd, uh, living in Singapore again. Usually, you'd expect that these two people will have zero probability of knowing each other because they are moving in completely different social circles. However, I was having dinner with this guy, and then I discovered with the IT nerd, and I discovered to my horror that they act that this guy, his name is Balaji, that Balaji actually knows Marcel. Right? So it was a very unusual thing in my mind because as a social scientist, I was like, okay, this is really interesting because the chances of this happening is close to zero. So then I kind of dug deeper to ask, hey, why, how come you know this guy, you know, Marcel? Uh, then he said, yeah, the reason, uh, so it turns out that both Marcel and Balaji are both very, uh, what do I say, passionate about uh, something called the singularity. Now, I don't know much about this, and apparently it's a big movement and all that about singularities. There's a singularity university. Even in Singapore, they have a branch, uh, and uh, these two guys are office bearers of the Futurist Society of Singapore and the Singularity University in Singapore. So that's how they came to know each other, because they both have a common shared interest in something. Otherwise, they would have never met. Right? So this is a very powerful way in which you can build connections. There are a whole bunch of things uh, of shared activity. What I have on the screen here, you can see like there's a reason why people play golf or play a sport, you know, cricket or, or tennis or whatever. It's a way to meet others who are there because they like that sport, but otherwise they're different from you. Similarly, if you're in a big organization, you're working in a huge company like Infosys or uh, TCS or Tata Motors or Unilever or whatever, you will have opportunity to, to participate in cross-functional task forces. Very important that you do so. Because then you, you end up meeting with people that you don't normally meet. And because you're working on some common thing together, you build a connection. Right? Similarly, the charity is on all kinds of volunteering works, even working with somebody else as co-authors. All these are examples of shared activities. Very, very important because it lets you build trust in a very low-cost way with somebody who is dissimilar to you. And the only reason you're both together there is because you're both interested in the joint activity. And this kind of thing is important because it builds, lets you, allows you to build a strong connection. Why is strong, trustworthy connection important? We go back to the starting point. We need private information to flow in our networks. So imagine this Marcel guy. Um, imagine Marcel wants to launch a new venture. Okay, he wants to sell his art online. Marcel knows nothing about computers. But who do you think he's going to turn to? To set up his platform and to try and do something online. He's going to turn to Balaji, right? So Balaji has expertise that Marcel does not have. And because they both have a strong connection and trust each other, he would expect Balaji to do his best to help him. Right? Which is what uh, entrepreneurs need at every stage in their journey. So this idea of building trust in a low-cost way um, and how uh, shared activity, the way to do that, is a very, very important principle.
right? So that way we build trust and diversity in our network. Both are important. The other thing that comes up often when we talk about uh, in, when we talk about networks uh, is you know what should be our orientation, interpersonal orientation? Because some people are go into an interaction with the intention to get. They're takers. Uh, and it's very, very easy for me to say this. Again, I'm repeating myself. It's very easy for me to say this, but it's really, really hard for us to do this, which is to give. Give without worrying about taking. Right? And that's a very important orientation. There's a nice Zen proverb, which I like a lot. If you want to go north, head south. Okay, so that's a, it's a very interesting um, uh, proverb because it tells us, you know, the focus on helping others very paradoxically comes back to help you in return, right? So just, just put, putting yourself out of the equation and trying to see how you can help another person is a very important skill or a very important orientation to develop. And it's not easy to do because every time we go into something like this for a task, you are always focused on what can I get? Right, rather than what can I give? Okay, let me take a quick pit stop here. We talked a little bit about spotting great opportunities or a good opportunity, which is solving an unsolved problem for some set of users in some innovative way. How do you do that? Well, you build strong ties to diverse people. Use those strong ties to find and innovatively solve tawny user problems. So that's one step of the entrepreneurial process. The second step, of course, we have to execute well on that good opportunity that you find. You have to move from the idea to an up and running venture. Then you need to scale up that venture. Every time you talk to an entrepreneur, they'll tell you about how all the bad things that happened to them when they were trying to launch their venture. Right? So you will end up as an entrepreneur, and some of you in the audience are probably already entrepreneurs, you will end up using your network to mobilize your resources, you will make those three AM calls. So there is something called Murphy, right? Murphy's law. So you will end up actually making those phone calls uh, because you want people to bail you out of sticky situations. In addition, as your business grows, right? As your business grows, there are a couple of things that you need to do. You need to adapt your own personal network. You need to adapt your own personal network. You need to form new connections. You need to figure out how you build and strengthen connections. What kind of a, what's your personality and match your networking style to your personality, right? Because why? If you ask entrepreneurs, their personal network becomes their organization's network six months, one year down the line, right? So that's kind of why it's important for you to grow and adapt your own personal network as your business is growing. How do you screen in contacts? Well, there are, uh, there are you, you can think about screening in contacts, uh, you know, in big organizations, employees tend to go towards a lovable fool. You know, this is that guy in that office. Um, I don't know if you've watched this show in India, it's called The Office, a very funny show. Um, and then you have this guy who's a pretty famous chef there was no more now, and he's kind of a complete like terror, right? Um, you need to think about entrepreneurs tend to go with this, even though, even though this person is a complete jerk, uh, you might end up actually wanting to connect with someone like that because you want to, you're pursuing opportunity. In addition, uh, you need to think about your own personality. Are you like this kind of person? Right, this is, um, um, some of you might know, this is a guy called Branson, uh, who runs this company called uh, Virgin, Virgin Atlantic, I mean, a whole bunch of things. He's famous for this quote on, uh, how do you become a millionaire? He says, his quote was, you start with a billion and enter the airline industry, then you become a millionaire, okay? That's his, that's his quote, which he's famous for, uh, he's a British entrepreneur. Very, uh, very, uh, what do you call um, extroverted personality, or you could also be like somebody like Bill Gates. I'm deliberately putting in here pictures of people with very different personalities who are equally successful. Okay, so you have to figure out which of these are which you're similar to which of these. They're both successful, 
They have different personalities. One is introverted, the other is extroverted. That is just your personality. That's who you are. That's how you need to know who you are and figure out how you build your connections, you know, which is consistent with your own personality. Okay. So just want to wrap up here. I know uh, we still have about 10, 15 minutes for questions, maybe. I want to wrap up in another few minutes and then um, have a conversation. Um, so just to sum up, the way you build and maintain relationships is very, very important foundational resource when you are an entrepreneur. Think about building an inner circle network of strong, high trust connections to diverse other people. And the word, so it's both trust and diversity at the same time. And that is really hard to accomplish. Which is why we talked a little bit about the referral thing and also the shared activity. Because shared activity and referrals are two good ways to build strong, high trust connections to diverse others. And this point, it's easy for me to put it in here, it's really hard for you to do. When you network, have no expectation of what you want from the other person, but seek to give, right? So give without keeping score. So think about it like this, very lonely journey as an entrepreneur. Networks give you the support and the confidence actually to venture out on your own, right? So entrepreneurship, always a risky journey, but some of you may become very successful, right? And all of these are ways for you to improve the odds of success, right? So having strong social capital um, is a way of improving your odds of success as an entrepreneur. Even if you forget everything I've told you so far, I want you to take away two important things. The first thing, first principle of networking, figure out ways to build diversity in your inner circle without compromising on trust. A great network is a byproduct of, pers of pursuing personally meaningful activity. Okay. So if you are really interested in volunteering for some society, go and volunteer. Don't do that because you want to meet someone there. Right? So it needs to be personally meaningful for you. Why? Because people will find out if you're faking it. If you're in Chennai, you know, there's a Carnatic music season. You want to make a connection to someone who is a Carnatic music lover, but you hate Carnatic music. It's going to show up in five minutes. If you go to a Carnatic, you know, Kacheri. So do not even try. Do things which you find personally meaningful. And by doing those activities, you will create connections which are to diverse people. So doing these active strategies, very important. And referrals in the shared activity, don't fake it. That's my point. And the second important point is again easy for me to say standing here as a prof but very difficult for any one of us including myself to actually practice this right which is focus on giving without keeping score right so that's very very hard to do um, but you know at least you can take baby steps towards that kind of an orientation right because that that trying to help without seeking anything in return is something which will keep, hold you in good stead when you become eventually become an entrepreneur. Okay, let me stop here and let me take stop sharing and then take questions. Uh, and then we can, uh, I think we have about 10 minutes for questions. Yes. Thank you, Bala. Uh, we'll now open the session for questions. Uh, does anybody from the audience have questions? Yeah, uh, may I? This yes, Hi. Hi, Dr. Visa. Yeah, Thank you. you. Can call uh, me Who's talking? If you have bandwidth, put your camera on. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Ashish. Hi. 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 So, yeah, I, I work with an incubator here in Hyderabad. Yeah. I just had a couple of questions. One, so if there is a structured way of uh, going about building social capital, which you also did highlight about, 
this is quite a, a common practice in west but uh, of course there some of it uh, we see in pockets in some of these major metros in india right but otherwise that's not a very common practice how do you see that that we bridge that challenge or gap sorry i didn't understand what is the gap so uh, uh, a structured way of going out to just meet people or using a referral to uh, support your venture and things like that are quite common practice in west and to some extent in metros in india as well but uh, in tier 2 tier th 3 cities that's not the case and these are subtle things that do matter a lot right um so uh, my my, uh, my advice would be to go and get mentors okay so uh, part of your part of your um, uh, sorry ashish are you an entrepreneur yourself or you help assisting other no, no. yeah I, i assist more. I, currently i'm facilitating more of facilitate okay so you know i think in your facilitation uh, uh, you know in, in your incubator the people who join you need to think ask them uh, you know who are who might be mentors for them and then try and figure out how to build a mentoring relationship with somebody because though that person can open doors um and and the question then arises why would anyone want to be a mentor for you exactly right? so so then you need to be thinking about um you know typically i don't know what the profile of your uh, incubators are but usually when you join a company uh you you will end up having people your boss uh, people around you seniors Uh, you will have to consciously think about building relationships those are the ones who might be actually your potential mentors when you step away step out and decide to become an entrepreneur right so um, so i would say use uh, you know think about mentors as people uh, who can open doors for you thank you thank you yeah. and uh, sorry there's one other question what kind of difficulties do women face while extending network particularly with opposite gender to earn trust and get things done so um and society takes it wrong so i would say uh, manjula the thing is that uh, the share activity thing is important right i think uh, i don't know which city you are in right now uh, but if you go to uh, you know you know let's say i'm interested in fintech okay i'm uh, i'm uh, or let's say manjula or, uh, is interested in fintech um then there must be some kind of a industry body a fintech association uh, other kind of communities around fintech around technologies go and participate in those communities while participating in those communities you are going to come up with you are going to talk and interact with others um i think india is changing very fast so i am not so sure um you need to worry so much about the perceptions of other people uh because you have you're getting together to you're interacting in a context around the technology or around the uh you know around the industry right so that so so i would say professional context is one way to avoid stigmas of the type that manjula is talking about potential stigmas right okay then um we have another we have another question from ashish Uh, so the key take away from building a social capital is not to follow give and take ideas uh, am i right sorry ashish can you come on the mic and just directly ask because i'm not sure i understand the question uh, hi professor uh, my bandwidth is low that's why i could not open the camera no no problem uh, what no what i what uh, i just uh, saw in your slides that you said that not to expect anything or or to expect very less when you are building a social capital so that's what i am clarifying so ashish can you give me some background about yourself are you a student are you what is your age what is your work experience what do you do right now i am 33 years old person and uh, i am working for a government organization it's a public sector unit and i am at a manager level how many years of experience do you have uh, almost 11 11 years okay so all i'm saying is that imagine you have 10 11 years of work experience and then um, you know you are um, you built up your uh, imagine next year you spot a great opportunity and you want to go and pursue it and you quit your job to do become an entrepreneur at that time how many people can you call up who owe you a lot of favors 
because you've helped them in the past. Right? I don't want you to answer the question. I'm just saying that is really the way you should be thinking about if you have helped a lot of people in the past because you have focused on helping them, right? Without worrying about what you get in return, think of it as like credit slips that you have with you. So that when you go and launch a venture, you will definitely need to encash those credit slips. Yes, Professor. That, that's all. Yeah. yeah. Thank and you. Thank also, you very much. Yeah. And also, when you are an entrepreneur with seven years or 10 years experience and you've already established yourself, this principle of giving without keeping score means you help other entrepreneurs. Yeah, that's what I, I experienced uh, all through my career that whenever I help, help someone, someday or the other day after a long period of time, I got a, I got a help from them. Okay. That's what but, I think. That, that is, I think, uh, what is the core idea? Is, what you correct. Are, the core uh, idea is to help without worrying about when, you will, when will the favor be returned. It's super easy for me to tell you. The reality is really hard for any one of us to do this. Yes. Right? That's all. And if you are, uh, you know, you have 11 years of experience, you've done this a lot. Next year, when you become an entrepreneur, believe me, you will have a lot of people who will come out and support you. Likewise, when you're, you're already a successful entrepreneur, you're running things for five, 10 years, do your best to help other entrepreneurs who are just starting on their journey. Right? So that's, that's the orientation I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Okay, thanks. I think Mamta's uh, goodness boomerangs may be delayed. I've experienced this. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. We have a question from Zabi. Zabi, would you like to tell your yeah. question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, Zabi here. Yeah, Zabi, uh, you can't come on um, this thing. Okay, low bandwidth. Okay, go for it, Zabi. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I'm out right now. Okay. Uh, in fact, like I had this doubt uh, for a while. Uh, in fact, I am building my own startup right now. I'm working on it. How old are uh, you and uh, what is your work experience and what are you? Uh, what is the startup about? I am, I'm, I'm 31. Mm. Uh, I'm doing my management uh, course at IIT Madras. Mm. And um, I have 10 years of experience, in fact. So okay. I worked for big corporates for, for the last 10 years. Okay. And I'm, I'm trying to establish my new uh, uh, startup here. Okay. So uh, the basic question here is uh, all about the strategy. So I'm trying to set the strategies, you know, every time I set the strategy, the strategies, you know, uh, it's like confusing. So uh, my first question would be, how do I survive this confusion of setting the strategies? And how do I ensure that the strategy is well-defined? Uh, with the vision and mission, the short-term goals and short-term, I look at the short-term opportunities and the long-term opportunities. Uh, for this, like, how do I uh, define the strategies well-defined or not? I, I really, um, so, so as an entrepreneur, I would say, I don't know where you are, whether you are, uh, which stage of the process you are in, but at the very early stages, you should be thinking about, you know, what people, you know, if you, you heard of that lean startup movement and all that, right? So yep. um, you, you, if you had, at the, if you're at the point where you have, uh, where you're thinking of a product market fit. Um, once you have product market fit, we can talk about like scaling up and all that. But if you're at the point where you don't, you don't yet have product market fit. In other words, you don't know what is the real problem that is being, what, what is the real problem that you, a set of users have or, and then how your product will solve that problem in, in some way, which is superior to existing solutions then you need to be thinking along those lines at the beginning. So don't worry so much about your strategy and mission uh, because you don't know. You might conclude that, in fact, you don't have a business there. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's right. I, okay. So I, I don't know if I'm... I understood your question, Zabi, as... Uh, yeah, actually, I, I get that because until unless you get to know my idea, like you know, what I'm trying to do it, like only then probably you can answer, like, no... You can give me that answer, actually. The question for you is, Zabi, do you have yes. to you do you believe you have product market fit? If so, tell what is the metrics that you are using to convince yourself that you have product market fit? Only after that will you be able to then think about how do I take there is how large is this market, and then how do I take my product and then 
you know, make sure that I consistently repeat this experience so that I can grow and so on. You know, only then will, will so that's a different set of issues around strategy and tactics. In the beginning, if you're thinking about exploring an idea, then um, you have to worry about the idea. What is the opportunity? Is it really an opportunity? Is it an opportunity for sufficient number of people? Is, am I having a solution to that problem? Right? Those kind of issues. So I would not worry so much about uh, you know, strategy and tactics because those all come later. In the beginning, your strategy and tactics is really, do I have, what problem am I solving for whom and how am I solving it? Fine. Uh, basically, based on the aspirations that I have, basically, yeah. Yeah. So I would ask you uh, to say it very succinctly, uh, you know, think about these three things, right? Because whenever you go and meet people, investors, customers, whatever, you need to have a very simple story, very simple 15-second thing on what is the problem your, your company is solving, for whom, and why it is important. What is the hook, right? So you need to... Uh, keep refining that. So that that one is uh, your first step. Correct. Okay. Um, any other last thoughts? Because I think I need to wrap up. Okay. Uh, so we have one question from Mamta. Um, any example of a business sailing high merely because of founders' social capital? Um, you know, Mamta, I, I I don't know. There are. It is just uh, the way I would think about it is the following: when you when you have a lot of social capital at the very beginning, you it might be easier for you to raise money, for example, because you know you can you you have people mentors who can connect you to an angel investor or a seed round VC. Uh, because at the very early stages, people are relying more on the founders and their backgrounds and their credibility. Uh, people with high social capital might be able to get. Maybe, maybe able to get customers or funding early on. But after a while, you know, it is really the quality of what your company is doing. Right? So, so I think, um, um, uh, you know, it, it, then it becomes more about what it is that you're doing more than anything else. Right? 